So we may well have another gigantic rally, but that would probably be the last. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. Thanks for joining us for part two of our interview with legendary investor Jim Rogers. If you haven't yet watched part one of our discussion with Jim, in which he explains why he expects that 2023 will see both the worst bear market and the worst recession of his lifetime, head over to our channel at youtube.com slash Wealthion and watch it there first. It sets the context for the investment themes we discuss in this video. Jim also thinks that the rally we're currently seeing in the stock market will be the last good rally before everything rolls over. And he shares his thoughts on which assets he thinks will best weather the coming storm. So be sure to stick around to hear that. Okay, let's get started watching part two of our interview with Jim Rogers. Global economy is slowing. Um, we are likely on a, a trajectory to the worst recession of your lifetime. Um, that said, there, there are cross currents that will be going on here, probably the whole time, but, but cross currents. In other words, while things are slowing, China may come to the rescue in the near term by opening back up and goosing things a little bit. But overall, the trajectory is going to be down. And at some point, we're going to tip into a really bad global recession, um, likely to be accompanied by a bad bear market, as you've been saying, maybe the worst bear market uh, of your lifetime and therefore our lifetimes as well. Um, do I have the arc right, or, or is there anything else you'd put in there? Well, I just want to uh, add that, you know, there's been a lot of pessimism around, as you well know. Uh, and in my experience, when there's huge amounts of pessimism, usually something happens to break the pessimism. We, we've had it in the last couple of weeks because people, the Federal Reserve has talked about, well, maybe we're not so not going to be so tough or whatever it is. Uh, this is not a projection, but suppose there's peace in Ukraine or something. Right. Yep. You know, something often happens to break the pessimism. You have a big wave of optimism and a gigantic rally. Gigantic rallies have often happened at the end of uh, bull markets or the beginning of bear markets. So we may well have another gigantic rally, but that would probably be the last one, if you ask me, usually at the end of a long bull market, when you have a gigantic rally at the end, it's usually the end. I mean, if you can remember NASDAQ at the end of 1999 and two, I mean, it skyrocketed. It's like doubled in six months or something, uh, just as we were about to collapse. This is the way markets work, fortunately or unfortunately. So I, I just want to point out when you have a lot of pessimism, start thinking about going to the other side for a while. That, that's, a, that's a great point. Um, we've had a lot of people on this channel who are experienced investors like you saying, hey, some of the most violent um, you know, rallies, upwards rallies have happened in bear markets, which is somewhat similar to the warning you're giving here. Um, we've also had people that have said, we've had the longest secular bull market in history, 40 years or so by some people's measurement. And you would expect that to end with a blow off spike as opposed to a whimper. Um, not saying you necessarily share that point of view, but the scenario that you just laid out could in some ways validate what those people are saying too. But what I hear you saying is, is um, there are reasons for why we could have a bad rally. What I hear you saying is, is I wouldn't trust that as being a secular return to a bull market. Um, it's more like the last gasp. It's the last rally before things really roll over. Well, as I repeat, about the end of the 1999, 2000, with that beginning of that bear market, it skyrocketed there at the end after a long secular bull market. And then it would, it, everybody thought, happy days are here again. This is going to go on forever. An interesting sideline. In 1999, I think that was the exact year, the Wall Street Journal, the Wall Street Journal, I mean, not some neighborhood newspaper, started using with capital letters that words, the expression, the new economy, capital mm -hmm. N, capital E. <laughs> this is the way they, the Wall Street Journal referred to the world. It was the new economy, capital N, capital E. 
they don't do it anymore, by the way. <laughs> they, <laughs> after, you know, it, didn't, it took them a while, but eventually they stopped capitalizing new economy. But that's how things get in long bull markets. That's how wild they get. And that last gasp, as we were discussing before, can be wildly exciting if you're on the right side. All right. So in the immediate term, don't get too pessimistic. Reserve the right to, you know, well, participate in, in, in a big surge here, but don't don't flip to being a permable because it could very well end. Um, I have heard I've seen too many times when everybody was on the same side of the boat. You better go to the other side of the boat when that happens. Got it. Um, but looking out on that trajectory here, then, um, is there any particular counsel that you would give to the regular investor, the, the viewer of this this video here, um, who's who would love to participate in some upside, but really their priority is just not to get killed by the downside here. Um, so they're probably less looking for a, a short term type of trade and more just sort of like, a, you know, is is, is there a. A, a secular trend that they can ride here. Um, I don't want to seed your answer, but I know that you're a big fan of hard assets. Um, but is there any particular counsel you'd give these folks? Well, back to what I said before, when the central banks panic and start printing money again, inflation comes back and the you know bonds are certainly in a bubble. They're not going to be in a bull market for decades. Property is going to have problems, as we've discussed. Many stocks have been a bubble. The only thing that's still cheap are real assets. And if they print money, when they print money, it leads to some things going higher, but those are usually silver, wheat, you know, real assets. The price of sugar is down 70% from its all time high. That's not a bubble. The price of silver is down 70% from its all time high. Those mm -hmm. are not bubble kind of numbers. <laughs> so the only thing that is cheap that I know of I mean, yes, there's property some places, yes, blah, blah, but, but the only thing as a class are real assets and they do go up when there's a lot of money printing. And so I, if people know about real assets, maybe they should do more research and homework and maybe that's a way to protect yourself. Okay, all right. And, um, uh, you know, right now, right now, don't say, I'm not saying how long we're gonna be in it. But right now, it seems like we're in a period of dis. We're back into a period of disinflation, right? Where we're we're coming down from the highs that the CPI has been at. Jerome Powell and his team are doing everything they can to kill demand. Um, that likely will probably go on for a few more months or quarters, um, unless and until you know there's something that forces a Fed pivot in, in the interim there. So my guess is you would say, you know, start doing your homework during this period. Um, and maybe starting a little dollar cost averaging, but but once there is a policy shift and it's back to easing again, hiking again, or sorry, uh, cutting rates again, then that's the time to really go into those assets that you just mentioned, because we'll be back on the inflation train. Well, but the stock, some stocks will go up too. I mean, you know, the hot shots, the hot shot stocks will go up again for a while. Yes, everybody will rush in and say, hooray, happy days are here again. You know, Amazon will go through the roof for a while. You know, Tencent will go through the roof for a while. But in the end, usually for a while, you have a bull market in real assets. And okay. for those who know what they're doing, be prepared. And, and Jim, how about, uh, so that's sort of the, the inflation market rule book. Does it differ at all in stagflation? So, you know, let's say we have that sugar high surge that you're talking about. But we get to a point where inflation really picks back up, but the, the economic growth hasn't. And we're just sort of mired in this period where inflation's high, but the economy is not doing too much. Um, is there anything that, that fits well for that playbook? Well, I, I've started investing in Uzbekistan recently. But most people watching this show couldn't find Uzbekistan on a map. <laughs> it was one of the Soviet republics. It was a disaster. It was ruined by the communists and even after the communists. And so it's very cheap. But now the people running the place run the way, run the country the way you and I would. And it's cheap. And there are not many stocks. So that might be an example. But my main answer to that question, which Uzbekistan feeds into, is only invest in what you know about. 
if you want to be successful, stay with what you know. Everybody watching this show knows a lot about something, whether it's fashion or cars or sports or something. Stay with what you know if you want to be successful. If I told you you can have 25 investments in your life, you wouldn't jump in and out of every hot shot you hear on a program or somewhere or in the newspaper, and you would be a successful investor. But many people would say, but that's boring. Be boring. If you want to be a successful investor, be boring. Don't go down to the bar on Saturday night yelling about how much Amazon you own or whatever it is. Be boring. Go down to the bar on Saturday night and let them all say, oh, my God, there's that guy again talking about his <laughs> boring, boring stocks. <laughs> be boring uh, if you want to be successful. Well, that's, that's, that's great counsel. I just want to remind people, um, you know, how successful your career has been as an investor and, you know, to get to get the pearls of, of, of what works from a guy like you folks, you know, listen closely when Jim speaks here. Um, you know, he's speaking from what, what has worked over the arc of his career. Um, all right, Jim, so look, as, as we begin to wrap things up here, um, I am curious because um, I, I'm glad that that several times in this conversation that you have, have flipped to focus on, on where the optimism in the story can be. Um, you're not just a gloomy guy by wiring. You're not at all. Um, but you got two daughters, and we've talked about some pretty serious issues that the world is facing in the future. And I'm just curious, is there any other counsel beyond what you've shared so far? I'm just talking about life in general. Um, as a father, you know, raising uh, children, and in your case, two daughters, and I have two daughters, so I've got a selfish, um, uh, you know, uh, hand in this fight. Um you know, how, how do you, how can you help them have some optimism in this future, you know, that they're stepping into um, where there will be some of these challenges and, you know, you're a successful guy. What are some successful secrets just for happiness in life you're passing on to your kids? Well, the answer to that question is, and I, I don't know how to do it, but is to teach them to figure out their own passions and then follow their own passions. Don't listen to their parents. Don't listen to their teachers. Don't listen to their friends. Figure out what they love. And if people laugh at you when you tell them what you love and what you're going to do, that really means you're doing the right thing. You know, you know you're on the right on the right track then, uh, because that Adam, those are the successful people in life. They get up every day. They never go to work. They get up and have a good time. And they're usually successful because they love what they're doing so much, no matter how absurd it is, you know. Uh, and even if they're not successful, I mean, they don't care because they're happy, you know. And, and you'd rather be unsuccessful and happy or successful and miserable. So I hope I can help them figure out what they really, really love and encourage them to do it, especially if it's absurd. And especially if everybody else thinks we're wrong. Well, Jim, I, I really appreciate that advice. Um, I, I am absolutely certain you've got much better things to do than to watch uh, Wealthy on week in, week out. But um, on our recent past um, weekly market recaps that I've done with Lance Roberts, we've actually begun to delve pretty deeply into this topic, um, exactly this, which is helping people, but in particular, the younger generation, find their way to their authentic career path. And there are uh, a number of, of resources and extra, and tools that, that, that are available to these days. I'm not going to go through them now. We're, we're talking about them in, in that weekly series. I will just mention one, though, because I assume a lot of people are going to be watching this video, Jim, because it's you. Um, of all the ones that I've found, um, the Johnson O'Connor Aptitudes Test is by far the most useful if you're just going to take one of these things. And so, folks, if you're watching, I don't have time to really give you the whole backstory here in this video, but go check that out. Um, it's a hugely useful tool, especially when your kids are, are younger. And by younger, I mean sort of mid to later teens where they don't have a lot of life experience to draw from yet. But it really helps them understand um, some key elements of themselves that won't change for the rest of their life that can help them find their way to what Jim is talking about here is the stuff that really makes their heart sing. Um, where they're going to outperform at because they're playing to their natural strengths. Uh, and of course, they're going to outperform and get recognized and rewarded for it. So, you know, they're going to win, their, their, their business partners are going to win. 
Um, it's a great, great test. Um, so anyways, Jim, thank you for that. I, I didn't know what your answer was going to be, but that, that that's a wonderful one. Wait a minute, what's the name? I want to go take it myself. Yeah, I think you should. The, the Johnson, John, Johnson what? The Johnson O'Connor Aptitudes Test. Um, the, I'm going to go take it. The, the quick 30 seconds on it is GE, over 100 years ago, they used to hire graduates from college. And that was back in the days where you spent your whole career at, at the same company, right? And they very wisely said, you know, we're recognizing that everybody is kind of better at certain things than everybody else, right? And if we could figure out what someone's personal superpowers are when we hire them, well, we could design a career path for them at this company where they're going to be playing to their strengths. We're going to get their best output. They're going to be the happiest. And so everybody agreed they just needed a, a test. So they hired this researcher, a guy named Johnson O'Connor, who created the test and it worked so well, they spun it off as a nonprofit. It's been running for ever since. So over a hundred years, there's um, over more than a million people have taken it. There's a ton of data. So there's no guesswork. It's just all super statistics. Very cool. I'll go take it. <laughs> All right, Jim. All right. Well, look, I, I can't uh, thank you enough, Jim, for coming back on with us, especially when you're traveling in a foreign country and coming out of uh, uh, quarantine. And and clearly you're at a wonderful place, the Rogers Lounge there. Um, so thank you for taking the time to speak with us. I look forward to having you back on the program in 2023 to call some audibles for us when we know a little bit more what it's going to be like there. Um, but uh, really appreciate it, Jim. Thank you so much for everything. It's always great fun. I look forward to 2023. I hope we all survive. I hope we all survive <laughs> the hard times. Well, all right. Well, now's the time when the channel will rebring in the lead partners from New Harbor Financial, one of the endorsed financial advisory firms by Wealthion, to react to what Jim said and talk about what's going on in the markets. And there actually are some important things to talk about in the markets relative to what Jim said. Um, John, why don't we start with you? Um, love to hear your reaction to Jim's commentary, um, but maybe also we can kick things off with uh, looking at the markets right now. Um, they've had a bit of an up week and they seem to be approaching a critical level here. Um, they are approaching the 200 daily moving average. Uh, there's a headline here on Zero Hedge saying that uh, S&P is 20 points away from a potential key breakout level here. Now, Jim talked about us potentially being in what he called, quote unquote, the last rally. So um, how important is this this technical level that we're flirting with here? Hey, Adam, great to be back. Uh, we, uh, you know, really enjoyed uh, Jim Rogers. He's quite the character. Um, love is- How can you not enjoy Jim Rogers? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a little disappointed you didn't uh, wear your, your bow tie uh, in the same way you did when Jim Grant was on, but- uh, wouldn't it be fun to sit in Roger's uh, lounge where he was and have a coffee with him or, or some other beverage? Really, really funny guy. Uh, I'd, I'd love to just start with homage to his his final bit of advice when you were talking with him about uh, any advice he might give to the younger generation, his daughters, your daughters, and love where he said, you know, just, uh, you know, follow your passion, which is a cliche, I know, and I don't think he means it in the way that many people do. And he, he kind of said, you know, uh, if, if people laugh at you, you're doing the right thing. I, I love that advice just to kind of basically be courageous and 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 do the things that maybe that other people aren't willing to do. Uh, right. And be authentic. Right. Fearlessly authentic. authentic. Yeah, Ex exactly. Um, but he's a, he's a really interesting guy. He, he you know, many people might know he he co-founded the, the Quantum Fund with George Soros. They had an amazing track record. He, quote unquote, retired uh, in 1980 and rode his motorcycle around the world, um, got the handles, the so-called investment bank uh, biker. Uh, so he's got a lot of perspective and, and certainly living over in Asia as he does now and has. It gives him, I think, a really unique um, Alabama boy. I think he was, he was raised in Alabama and, uh, and looking over back at the U.S. from Asia. I think it gives him just a world of perspective that comes through in some of his humoristic uh, takes on, on, on where we are in the world. But yeah, he, um, so look, we, 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 we have been, saying over the last several months that we believe we're in a uh, 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 probably uh, the early stages of a secular bear market, but one that will likely be defined as it has been so far this year to date. And, and really all notable bear markets in history are defined by some very sharp bounces and rallies along the way. Um, 
In other words, bear markets don't happen in a straight line. They happen with a lot of frustration. And we happen to be in, in the midst of, uh, of a balance, a pretty strong balance that's brought us right back to um, a very cr critical juncture in the markets. You know, the S&P 500 is right about at its 200-day moving average. Uh, and, and a breakout above that from a technical standpoint might, you know, certainly fuel some, some follow through. You get into the seasonality, things like the Santa Claus rally and, and uh, the prospect of a... Um, you know, a, a gridlock Congress. These are all things that anecdotally can be supportive of, of moves higher. Um, and, and we're we're not uh, at all, um, you know, uh, resistant to that possibility. In fact, we're, we're, we're quite open to it and have done several tactical trades on the long side this year. And we're about to, to tee up another one, in fact, today uh, that we'll, we'll uh, probably be able to talk about. Um, but the bo bottom line is, um, you know, he he he. I think summed it up very nicely. Uh, any any big rally here might be the last before a really hard swoosh down. We agree that's a, a fairly likelihood if we do get a big big continued move higher here. Uh, in other words, folks that are really uh, looking to keep their retirement savings safe. That uh, you know, this is not a time to be thinking about uh, riding a multi 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 year bull market. It's it's at most probably a, a flash higher that that sees further downside ahead and, and, you know, trying to time that exactly perfectly is very hard to do. Uh, and, and still in the broad landscape, we think um, uh, bags and demands a, a very conservative posture in the, in the grand scheme of things. Um, Jim said, you know, nothing's cheap out there except for natural uh, real assets. And, and we agree with them. Stocks aren't cheap and we'll talk more about it, but I'll, I'll just stop there. And, and uh, I'm sure we've got plenty more to talk about. All right, Mike, we'll come over to you. We'll let you chime in any way you like. Um, if you can, though, talk about the importance of if we do punch above the 200-day moving average, um, what kind of juice that could add to the markets here, especially because I believe the 200 is not that far from the 50-day moving average, and there's a technical term for if you punch above both pretty quickly. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct, Adam. I'm taking a look at the chart right now in front of me. We're sitting at the 200-day uh, moving, moving average. The 50-day moving average, I need my glasses, is a little bit below at around 38, 38.80 or so. And so if we punch higher in a fast way, or even if we go sideways to slightly up over an intermediate period of time, the 50-day will cross the 200-day. And, you know, that's the so-called golden cross. That could very likely cause more bullish reaction because it's a pretty simplistic indicator, but it's widely followed. And so even though we remain in this kind of hyper overvalued state, um, if the technicals actually look like we could very well move higher from here. And we'll we'll see. The big picture is that we've been in a downtrend since the, the high in the S&P, which I think was January 4th. And it's a pretty well-defined broadening downtrend almost like a, um, it's it's a bearish, basically megaphone pattern. And if we break through to the upside, as you said, zero hedge said 20 points higher, and I'm guessing that they mean the high of the handle and the so-called recent cup and handle uh, consolidation, which is again, only about 20 points higher. You know, it, it projects up quite a bit higher than here. Just, you know, again, looking at the charts, it would be somewhere in the 43 to 4,500 range on the S&P would be the short-term projection. At the same time, you would have a crossover of the 50 uh, over the 200-day moving average, almost certainly. So this is what's really tricky about this environment as money managers or as individual investors. You've got a hyper overvalued market that has not been allowed to clear. I could even, I could even argue that we haven't really seen a true market clearing event in 30 years. You know, 2008 low was not a market clearing event. 2002 really was not a market clearing event in terms of excursion to undervalue. Even at the low in 2009, we only hit a, a cyclically adjusted PE ratio of about 15, which is long-term average at best. So, you know, we're dealing with this, this market that's been almost, you could say, permanently overvalued. We've got internals, which are not great in terms of breadth and a whole bunch of other things. And this is a market that only trades based on what the central bank says and what people think the central banks are going to do. And you know, there was some talk early in the conversation with Jim about central banks that you know, he says this market has been driven by nothing other than artificial stimulation. He's right. 
But he also said that he believes that artificial stimulation is coming to an end. So you've got a hyper overvalued market, a Fed that's tightening, bad internals in the market. At the same time, really short term here, it seems like we did have some pessimism a month or two ago that might have been short term extreme and probably was short term extreme and a technical pattern that seems like it wants to break to the upside with a 50 200 day moving average crossover, which looks likely if this continues. So what do you do? I, I think we would say just be careful. If you're going to do anything, do it tactically in small, uh, uh, small size. When I see tactically, keep your position size small. If you know how to use options, hedge it with options. We're certainly going to do so. We're looking at adding a small um, trade in regional banks uh, today, and we will certainly hedge that with very near term or close to at the money short call options, which will give us some forgiveness. It'll give us some forgiveness, maybe five or six percent to the downside, something like that. But this is the type of market where you want to have some forgiveness for imperfect entries. So overall, yeah, short term, things are actually looking like they want to break higher, but we're not going to take big positions. And we would suggest that most people don't either and that they hold a good amount of cash for what's likely going to be plenty more opportunities down the road. All right. And presumably, you know, if you've got long positions and we do rise from here through the end of the year. Don't want to put words in your mouth, but my guess is you would say, use that as an opportunity to lighten up those positions at the higher prices to build cash as this rally, should it grow, grows. Yeah, I would absolutely say that. I mean, frankly, I would be lightening right here if you've got too much equities. Bonds, long-term bonds have been hit, hit really hard. So I would, I'm not as... Um, uh, driven to say, you know, immediately reduce your, your longer term high quality bonds. But certainly if you're in stocks in your traditional 60-40 mix, maybe 60% equities, 40% bonds, definitely look to get equities down, maybe towards 30%. You don't have to do it all at once. You can do it in pieces. Although if you were to do it all at once, I think you'd be okay to rebalance now. But yes, absolutely. Because we don't know. This could just be a head fake. There's a lot of times that the market will break out even clear in the handle of a cup and handle pattern and then immediately fail. The surprises should be to the downside in a bear market. And I think that this is, as Jim said, likely the largest bear market in our lifetime. I think he said that someday we're gonna have the largest bear market in our lifetime and someday could be today. So I wouldn't be playing games with timing. Start to lighten up now. And certainly if we go higher, lighten up even more. Yeah. And Jim, you know, he's got a great way of putting things. He doesn't mince words. Um, you know, uh, this is the last rally before the worst bear market of our lifetime, uh, which will be coincident with the worst recession of our lifetime. Uh, I shouldn't be laughing at this. Um, but, uh, you know, there's a there's he presented a good case for why you know that could be the case here. Uh, and look, you know, nobody knows what's going to happen. Um, and while we think there's a preponderance of evidence that of reasons to be bearish, um, you know, who knows? The market, you know, has surprised people, you know, doing things that thought they never thought it could do more times than we can count throughout history. So there could be a, a, an even bigger bullish run here than what you're potentially referring to here. And so you have to have, you know, some some part of your portfolio that's positioned j just in case of that. Um, but I, I want to ask you guys, so to clear, you know, kind of how you guys see things here. Um, Mike, you mentioned getting, you know, potentially down to like a 30% equity exposure level. Um, John, I'm, com I'm coming to you with this question. Um, I, I know in your New Harbor portfolio, as you guys have told us, um, your biggest equity holding is in uh, precious metals mining companies. Right. Um, and my well, you tell me I, my I'm assuming you're not go, if, if we have a nice rally in the markets and everything participates in that over the next month or so. I'm assuming you're probably not going to lighten up too much on those equities. Um, let me know if that's not the case. And also my assumption, correct me if I'm wrong, is that as the prices of the miners go up, that instead of lightening up, you will probably be adding hedges, more hedges to the position just in case there is a general market correction and it brings that those stocks down with it you're protecting that exposure you have what's your answer there yeah so precious metal mining stocks are one of our more heavily weighted uh equity exposures right now forgetting about what they do for a moment they are 
about as uh, uh, much of a value play you can find in the stock market right now. They've got uh, done done tremendous work to clean up their balance sheets. They've got really attractive free cash flow. So forgetting what they do, they're just fundamentally a good good value stock, we believe right now, um, have been very challenged in recent times. And that's why we've been hedging them. But they've had a very nice bounce in the last handful of weeks here. Uh, GDX as a proxy is bounced from the low 20s up to around $28 a share. Um, so that's been a very, very swift, nice bounce here from, from what we think are, were very oversold levels. Uh, and yeah, further strength is usually a good sign, especially when you get something uh, such a value and so oversold. Uh, so we would likely um, follow through with that, that upside move if it were to happen with um, moving our hedges up, maybe relaxing those hedges a bit. Um, you know, when I say moving hedges up, it's kind of the same notion as a trailing stop for folks that use stop orders on, you know, basically allowing the discipline to, to you know, trend higher with with the stock as it, as it goes higher. Um, we also have uh, a fairly heavy weighting in, in emerging market stocks, which again, are, are on a relative basis, are, are, are deep values relative um, to the U.S. stock market. Um, and we actually do have, you know, some good exposure there. Um, one thing I want to uh, point out, you know, this is a year where where most stocks and bonds are down for for folks that have been heavily invested and, and passively invested, perhaps. So when Mike talked about uh, using this time to 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 lighten up stock exposure, it actually presents for most people a good time to do it, but at the same time mitigate uh, capital gains taxes because there are probably some opportunities to harvest losses elsewhere in the portfolio. So this is a really good time. Uh, to if, if folks have been resistant to sell uh, high flying stocks because they didn't want to incur capital gains, they very well likely may be able to uh, sell those and offset uh, gains that otherwise would be taxable by by harvesting losses. And that's something that we try to do with some discipline where, where it makes sense for our clients, uh, certainly as as year ends uh, approach uh, in, in the calendar year. Great. And there's two things I want to mention just to piggyback off your commentary there, John. One is um, in terms of the mechanics of how you'd be using options to protect the position, I just want to remind folks who might not have seen it that you and Mike did a, a really great uh, free webinar in explaining the fundamentals of options to people and walking through how you use them, you know, some basic um, uh strategies and how you use them protect to protect positions. Folks, if you haven't seen that, and if that's a topic that interests you, just go to wealthion.com slash options trading, uh, and you can watch it there. I've gotten a lot of great feedback on that. Uh, Adam, secondly, Adam, quick, quick, yeah. quick correction. I think it was options hedging, not options trading. Oh, God, I'm sorry. You're right. Options hedging. <laughs> and we'll make sure that when we put the overlay on the screen, we show the correct URL. Thanks for the correction there, John. Um, and then secondly, you mentioned tax loss harvesting. We've mentioned it a couple of times recently on this program. Uh, so I won't I won't go back and reflog that horse. Um, but I just want to say to folks that um, you know, if you're sitting on some losses in your portfolio, it can be a very intelligent strategy to reduce taxes, as John mentioned. And uh, it's a great thing to give your professional financial advisor a call about now. Um, as we approach the end of the year to get their guidance on, you know, tactics that you might want to take in your own portfolio to, to maximize uh, your, your tax losses. Um, all right. So, um, uh, Michael, come back to you with this question here, which is, you know, the markets are, um, they're up a bit this week. Now it's a light week of trading. This is the Thanksgiving. We're going to the Thanksgiving holidays here in the U.S. Um and we just talked about some technical reasons why the market, you know, could power higher here as we go into the end of the year. And we've talked on this program with you guys and with some of the other experts on this channel about, um, you know, the, the the capital flows that go on at the end of the year with the major funds where they're basically selling their losers and then buying back the companies that did the best this year. So there's a lot of window dressing that goes on that that near the end of the year kind of adds some extra buying pressure uh, to the the big stocks. Um, also, buybacks are back in place. So there's a lot of things right now that could bring the market up a bit higher from here. I do want to flag, though, something that is continuing to unfold here, which is the FTX scandal. And um, it seems like every day, you know, there's some new development there that just blows our minds about how absolutely poorly managed um, and fraudulently run, in many cases, uh, FTX seems to have been. Um, but more seriously, uh, there's 
you know, a lot of value has been vaporized as the world has woken up to, you know, what happened there. Um, and then of the remaining assets that were in the FTX portfolio, it's been said by the auditors that are going through, uh, you know, the rubble that a fair amount of those assets are missing and or have been stolen, right? So, I mean, we're talking in the billions and probably total losses, tens of billions here. Um, we're beginning to get the names of hedge funds and, you know, other big players that were um, caught by surprise by this, that had substantial funds um, in FTX or in FTX subsidiaries. And so there's this sense of, of, of contagion that's unfolding in real time right now that we don't know how deep it goes, how far it goes. The latest estimate I've heard in terms of creditors that are going to be um, lined up against FTX here is in the millions at this point in time. But like I said, there are going to be some big players that are going to be losing a lot on this. It might be catastrophic losses for these firms. And as these things, these scandals tend to happen, you don't know who they are on day one or day two of, of the crisis. You find out oftentimes a month later, three months later, et cetera. Um, so that's this other sort of set of shoes to drop in the story here that could actually be very market negative as all of a sudden we find, you know, some big funds uh, all of a sudden are forced to liquidate because they, they, you know, reveal to the world, hey, I know nobody knew this, but I lost my shirt in FTX and we're having to shut down here. So how how big a concern is that contagion risk for you right now? Oh, I think that contagion is is quite likely. I mean, I think that there's a lot of problems out there that we we don't see yet. Like they like they say, you, you don't know who's swimming naked until the tide goes out. And for instance, I don't think we would have ever found out about Bernie Madoff if it wasn't for the 2008 2009 housing crash. You can get away with a lot in a mega bubble, but once things start to break. Um, then you can really see where the frauds are. And maybe it's too strong of a word, but there, there's some, if not fraud, certainly hot air built into this, this greatest bubble of our lifetime that we've been living through. You know, Bitcoin and all of the, a lot of other cryptos were, were just kind of caught up in that whole bubble, particularly in 2021. Bitcoin just printed below 15,000 uh, yesterday. It's back above 16,000 now. And who knows what the real value is? I still really don't see many places where you can spend crypto. I know there's a few, but you know it, it seems to have been caught up into this in, in this entire bubble. And of course, you just mentioned FTX. That's part of it. Coinbase is another example. I mean, not Coinbase, but um, sell. I mean, there was a place uh, place called Celsius where you could deposit your crypto and get paid eight to 12% interest rate. It seemed too good to be true. Seems like it is too good to be true in hindsight now. And there's probably a lot of other things out there that we have no idea what they are. And once one thing gets sets off, uh, set, sets off it often sets off another chain reaction, like you said. And this is all because of using Jim's words, you know, um, the central banks have printed money like crazy and they probably will do so again. They'll print money until they run out of trees. I think he said in his words, and, you know, we've tried to abolish market cycles, but you really can't. He mentioned the old Testament. You've got seven good years and seven lean years or, or, or bad years in the last 30 or so years, we've had uh, this kind of permanently high plateau of hyper overvaluation at the same time, the debt has been expanding from maybe seven or eight trillion back in 2008 to 31 trillion now. And now every time we try to correct the central banks run and, and, and save us. And of course, everyone says, and the politicians say too, please save us, please save us. And the central banks do it. So we've created these bad incentives to, you know, to really go out on a limb over levers, way too much speculation. And I've got no doubt to kind of close off this thought that there's an, there's an enormous amount of bodies buried out there and we just don't know what they are. And we will find out as this thing unfolds, as it almost certainly will. I agree with Jim. Once again, we're probably in or close to the, uh, the beginning of, even if we get one more big spike higher, the largest bear market and the largest recession of our lifetimes. So. All right. Well, well said. And that, that's a good sort of trajectory for the conclusion here to where I want to bring this is um, a lot of the experts that I've had on this program, uh, again, they all don't completely agree, but but a consensus arc is sort of um, the bear market's not over. It's it's going to go down further for a lot of the reasons that Jim mentioned. Um, and, and at some point, um, it will 
it will likely get bad enough. Um, the recession, the collateral damage from all the Fed's uh, hiking and quantitative tightening and whatever, where um, the federal, the, the 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 central banks, Federal Reserve and other central banks, um, will likely be pressured slash forced to engineer another rescue, right? And then that rescue potentially could be the biggest one we've seen yet, right? And so from a um, you know, destruction of the purchasing power of the currency standpoint, it's a real concern that folks have, right? Which is sort of like, you know, they, they, they goosed us to get us out of the pandemic. They created the last hurrah of the everything bubble. That's now bursting right now. Uh, Fed's hands are tied in the short term, as as many other central banks by the current inflation. Um, they're going to tip us into, you know, disinflation and maybe actual real deflation. It's going to get so bad, they're going to have to engineer another rescue, which many experts think is going to be really inflationary, right? Um, and so that, of course, you know, brings people back to the topic uh, of gold. I, I know that, that John, that's not the reason why you guys are invested in the miners right now is, oh, we're worried that the value of the dollar is going to go to zero tomorrow. Um, I know you guys have long-term concerns. Um, but but I know your fundamental positioning in those companies right now is largely based upon just how cheaply valued they are for the cash flows they have. But um, there are a lot of people out there who do have long term concerns about fiat currency. Um, and I'll let you guys give any commentary on, on any of that you want to. But one of the reasons why I'm bringing this up, folks, believe it or not, uh, is because uh, this is Thanksgiving week, um, along with Thanksgiving uh Today in modern culture is uh, Black Friday. You know, a lot of people start their holiday shopping. Uh, and on this channel a year ago, I, I mentioned briefly a company that uh, shares investors with Wealthion that was offering a, uh, a special offer to Wealthion um, viewers last year. Um, we got a lot of good feedback from that. They are extending the same offer this year. So I just want to mention it really briefly. It's a company called Overe. Uh, it is a jewelry company, a precious metals jewelry company. And um, basically, its mission is, look, we think there's lots of good reasons to own gold and that people from all socioeconomics uh, should own some gold or silver, um, own it in many ways, like you guys offer, you guys recommend is almost sort of just like a little bit of a crisis hedge, just have a little bit on hand, right? But the premise is, um, why not have it in a form that you enjoy? Um, also, by by making it well-designed jewelry, they increase its appeal to a wider audience than just the folks that are worried about the purchasing power of fiat currency. So they're kind of getting more people into the precious metals lifeboat, uh, even if the people don't realize that that's why they're <laughs> they're coming in. They think they're just coming in because they're getting some nice jewelry. Uh, and of course, we've heard many, many stories here from folks who, uh, you know, kind of believe the reasons to own some precious metals. Um, but their spouse isn't really quite on board and they have a lot of you know friction about well why are you buying gold and silver um just seems like a waste of time and money oftentimes that conversation goes very differently when you say hey honey here's some jewelry for you <laughs> and it's just received as a really pleasant gift so anyways um the company is called overe.com um i'll put up uh, an example of some of their jewelry here um i just want to let you folks know um, they are offering a Black Friday sale, uh, which is running through now through November 28th um, for all full priced 22 and 24 karat gold jewelry and all full priced sterling silver jewelry. They are offering a 50, sorry, 15 percent off discount to all wealthy on viewers. If you uh, go on the Obear website, poke around, find something you like, um, just type in AU Wealth 15. I'll put that code up here on the screen uh, when you're checking out and you'll get the 15% discount there. So, all right, folks, just wanted to let you know that you were getting that nice little uh, benefit there from Ober again this year. Um, also, just want to mention a couple other quick uh, free resources as we, we wrap up here. Um, one, as I've been doing for all our major interviews uh, recently, um, I have uh, written down my key takeaways from the interview with Jim. So if you don't feel like you took good enough notes or want to see what I captured from it, uh, just go to wealthion.com slash Adam's notes and you'll get them there for free. Um, also, just a quick reminder, too, if you have not watched that uh, options hedging webinar from John and Mike and would like to, uh, that'd be a great one to watch after this video. Just go to wealthion.com slash options hedging. 
Um, John, I will let you have the last word in uh, in sending us out here. Um, I, I do want to just, as I hand the baton to you, just in the spirit of uh, the week of Thanksgiving and gratitude, I want to thank you and Mike again for just being such uh, great champions for financial literacy, huge supporters of Wealthion. Um, you and I have been working together for about a decade before I, I founded Wealthion, uh, and you guys have helped. I've seen you guys helped uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, probably thousands at this point, uh, of clients that that we've referred over to you guys over the years. Um, I really uh, appreciate your calm uh, and and risk managed stewardship of client assets. And given the type of future that Jim sees us going into, it just seems like we're we're going to need that more than ever. So I'll let you wrap things up here, John. Yeah, thank you, Adam. Uh, and really, on behalf of our whole team uh, at New Harbor. Uh, we have very much enjoyed and appreciated our uh, continuing collaboration with you. It's It's been over a decade, and um, the, the work you've done on Wealthion to expand the horizon in education has just been remarkable, and, and uh, kudos kudos to you. Congratulations. We're, we're thrilled to be a, a, a small part of, of that experience, um, and uh, at the end of the day, we, we, we're here for a very important uh, job, you know, and, and it's a humbling job, humbles us when when being in the trust business like we are, uh, no doubt about it, this this involves a huge amount of trust. We are asked to do some very important thing for, things for clients and their hard-earned assets that have all kinds of implications uh, in their life, uh, their, their real life, their, the real daily decisions they're able to make, the psychological and emotional ride that their financial life brings them on to have folks turn to us for uh, education, or if they ultimately become clients for for stewardship and, and guidance, it's a really humbling thing, and, and we're very grateful for uh, being asked and and uh, you know uh, and given the opportunity to do such an important thing because it's meaningful work for us. It's not always fun. It's it's a challenging profession in these times, for no doubt, but it's an important one, and we, we we're very thankful for that. Well, good, and Mike, I'll let you comment too here as we head on out. I just want to say that I'm very thankful as well for the uh, continued trust uh, that our that our clients place with us. And we're grateful for the people that we talk to as well all the time, every day that are not our clients or that don't become clients. We enjoy every one of those conversations. And uh, last but not least, Adam, we want to thank you and Wealthion for all the, you know, the partnership and the great work uh, that we've done together and has allowed us to have this platform to just try to educate. So thank you very much. And I wish I uh, wish everybody a great th Thanksgiving. Great. And yeah, th thank you guys for the kind words. But but really, in my case, guys, um, I have uh, I have the pretty wonderful job of, of really just being the avatar for the viewer here. I mean, literally, I'm, I'm just like everybody else watching this who's just trying to figure out what's going on and and trying to pick the brains of smart experts out there and thank you guys for being included in that that cadre of experts and being willing to come on this program week after week after week as well as having all of the free conversations with folks you guys you guys have during those consultations um and it's interesting so you know i, I get asked a lot hey you know what were the criteria that you guys used in picking financial advisors and there was a checklist we go through and you know, risk management's a big part of it. Performance is a big part of it. Um, transparency, independence, all that type of stuff. But number one at the list is trustworthiness. And what's great about you guys in particular is we have such a long history here that uh, it's not a thesis, um, it's a reality, meaning I've worked with you guys long enough uh, to see how you handle yourselves in many different types of situations. Uh, and so the verdict is in on that. And, and, and one of the things I appreciate about you guys, um, which is important to our viewers here, is that um, you know, the currency here at the end of the day is, is is trust, right? Why are people coming back and listening to you guys on this channel? It's because you've proven yourselves to be um, both uh, quality advisors. You're delivering you know quality of commentary week after week, but you're also a good steward of client assets. And there's that old saying that trust takes a lifetime to earn uh, but can be lost in a second, right? Um, you guys understand exactly how important it is to to retain, you know, your your role there, and and to not do anything untoward or that would jeopardize that that sense of trust in you. And and that's what makes me, as the guy who's kind of putting his neck out there, brand wise, uh, with this relationship, sleep really well at night. Um, and and on that vein, folks, um, uh, you hear me say this all the time, uh, but if you uh, 
look, g- given everything these guys and I have just talked about, and with Jim, obviously, uh, no surprise, we think you should be working with a good professional financial advisor. If you've got a good one, great, stick with them. Uh, but if you don't, um, you know, this is the time, given everything else we've just talked about, especially going into year end here, where there are lots of, um, you know, specific tactics you could be taking in the next 30 days in your portfolio. Uh, to talk with a, fin- a financial advisor, just make sure they're a good one and that they take into account all the macro issues that we've talked about here. And uh, if you don't have a good one handy um, or would like a second opinion from one, uh, just you know, fill out the short form at Wealthion.com. Uh, talk to one of the advisors that we endorse, uh, maybe even John and Mike and their team at New Harbor themselves. Um, it's totally free. It's no commitment. doesn't cost you anything. It's just a public service that gets offered. Um, this is really, especially as we approach the end of your deadline, you know, the right time to be doing all this, um, especially given what we all think might happen next year. Um, all right, guys. Well, look, um, uh, again, thanks so much. Have a wonderful Thanksgivings. Uh, take it easy uh, on the turkey. Uh, I know we all just want to go hog wild this time of year, and I'll probably, you know, let the monster out of the cage a little bit. Um, but uh, remember, health is the greatest wealth. Um, everybody else, um, just thanks so much for watching. Uh, John and Mike, uh, whatever happens in the markets over the next week, uh, probably be a little tranquil given the, the Thanksgiving holidays, but I'm sure there'll be a few curveballs. Whatever they are, we'll talk about them next week. Everyone else, have a wonderful Thanksgiving, and thanks for watching. Thanks, everybody. See you soon, Adam. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody, and uh, we'll see you soon. Adam, thank you. If you'd like to schedule a consultation with one of the financial advisors at New Harbor Financial, simply go to Wealthion.com. These consultations are completely free and there are no strings attached. The good folks at New Harbor will simply answer any questions you have about your investment goals or your portfolio and give you their best advice given their latest market outlook. They're willing to do this because they care about protecting people's wealth. And because Wealthion has connected them with so many thoughtful investors just like you over the past decade. We started doing this because so many people have approached us in frustration, looking for a solution because they're feeling out of alignment or downright ridiculed by the standard financial advisors who have been managing their money. You know the type. The kind that just pushes all of your money into the market, scoffs at the idea of owning gold, and when you bring up concerns about the market's sky-high valuations, they say, don't worry the market will always take care of you. For many of the reasons discussed in today's video, we think this is one of the most challenging and treacherous times in history for investing. We strongly believe that today's investors are best served working in partnership with a conscientious professional financial advisor who understands the risks in play. Now we're agnostic which professional advisor you work with, as long as they're good. If you're already working with one, that's fantastic. Stick with them. But if you don't, or are having trouble finding one you respect or trust, then consider talking to John and Mike and the team at New Harbor. Now, for those about to ask, yes, there's a business relationship between Wealthion and New Harbor, which we put in place to make sure everything is handled according to SEC regulations. All the details on this are clearly provided on the Wealthion.com website. Also, it's important to note that New Harbor is able to work with U.S. citizens, green card holders, and those with existing assets in the USA but for regulatory reasons, they aren't able to take on non-U.S. clients. All right, with all that said, if you'd like some insight and guidance on how to protect your wealth during this unprecedented time in the markets, go to Wealthion.com to schedule your free consultation with the good folks at New Harbor. Thanks for watching.